Uh, before we, we dive into uh, the, the remainder, the half of this, um, I was watching a TV show and they actually, in the midst of the show, they, uh, one of the characters uh, repeated the oath of, of office, oath of congressional office. And, and I was like, oh, I, I, I never really paid attention to the words, especially in light of our, our uh, lesson, uh, lawful oaths and vows. And so I, I printed it out and I wanted you all to, to hear it because you can, you can begin to see how, um, how we are to understand uh, even in our practical sense, how the Westminster Confession has impacted uh, what we do here, even in the United States. So this is the oath of office that uh, I think most congressional leaders take. So it's not the president, but anyone who's going into Congress takes this uh, oath of office. It says, I name do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will, I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I'm about to enter, so help me God. Um, so it, what, what caught my ear, especially in there, well, before I had said, what, what, what has caught your ear, perhaps? I want to hear from you a little bit in light of what we've talked about, the uh, lawful oaths and vows. Is there something in there that maybe has caught your ear? That uh, without equivocation or mental reservation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it is, it is, yeah. What else? I can do it again. So I name do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I'm about to enter. So help me God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and but it's... But he's saying, so help me God. Yeah. So is it more like, you know, when you hear it, it says, blah, 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 so help me God. Or is it, so help me God. Well, you know, it... There isn't actually any punctuation in the copy that I found on Wikipedia. There is, it just says, so help me God. It's, it's one sentence. So, you know, I don't know what the inflection would, would be. It depends on well, who is saying. Yeah, yeah. Without inter so the interference. Mm -hmm. When you say without any inter interference from any, um, maybe that's not the word. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion? Is that what you're referencing? Yeah. So the oath taker could put his own inflection on that, like she wanted it, mm -hmm. so help me God, or, or just so help me God. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and this is uh, the modern version, actually, so help me God is optional now. Uh, but I think, you know, the, when it was first instituted, it, it wasn't. But going back to the, the word swear, um, there's actually an option that you don't, you don't say swear, but I affirm. You know, so I do solemnly affirm that I will support and defend. So, you know, it's because some people don't like swearing um, in, in God's name, even though hopefully as we've seen Sorry. that it's actually, God's not telling us not to swear. Um, I think pinpointing, uh, was it Gary, did you point out the faithful or was it bar? True, True faith. Yeah. So there's this notion that again, this, when, when, when we take an oath, whether it's this, you know, kind of a secular oath, but it still has religious connections, connotations to it. We are, the oath that we're taking is faithfully discharging the duties, whatever it is, faithfully discharging what we're promising to do. Uh, that's the, again, we talked about some of the things that a lawful oath and vow is. It, it, you can't promise to do something that you can't fulfill. You shouldn't promise to do something you can't fulfill. You, uh, you know, what, what Carolyn noted was the same thing that I noted, you know, without mental reservation or purpose, you know, that, that, that language is actually, is very similar to, to the Westminster Confession, especially, um, what was it, verse in Article 4, uh, you know, without equivocation or mental reservation. I mean, that's, that's pretty much a direct quote from the Westminster Confession of Faith. Uh, and that's what, that's what caught my ear, is that there is a, 
it, it's not just a, a you know a, a general outline. I mean, there's a there is a, a one to one correlation with the oath of congressional office and the Westminster Confession of Faith, and I don't think that was by accident. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Served on that, so you see some of the church. And, and and I I need to do some more research on it, and I I don't know. This is this is me making conjecture without research, but I feel pretty confident that I could probably find the research to support it. My because the Westminster Confession again was started, you know, obviously it was it was before the United States ever became the United States. Now, of course, the colonies were around; everybody knew about them, uh, but this is this is before 1775, and so the um, the the document that that we have before us was there to, as I mentioned before, to replace the, or update the Book of Common Prayer for the Church of England. Uh, and I said, you know, the, the nonconformists, the Presbyterians, the Puritans, they were in charge of Parliament at the time. They actually lost power pretty quickly after this. I think within 20 or so years, I think it was the, the English ref or the uh, Civil War was 1660 something. So that's 20 years after the starting of this document, which was in 1643 or that assembly, uh, when this document was drafted, I think in 1647, finally. And so we, we, what we see, and again, this is just conjecture, but what I think is going on is the, our founders, uh, certainly the Puritan f founders of our nation, so the, the folks who came over here from England, from Scotland, who were fleeing the, the persecution of the, the Church of England, the Catholic Church, uh, against the nonconformists, which is essentially what Presbyterians were. We were, we were considered nonconformists. We wouldn't conform to the, the liturgy and the, the politics of, of the Church of England. And so uh, I certainly think that all that, you know, all those folks coming here, the bringing with them the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Scots Confession and, and bringing with them the Geneva Bible uh, and uh, and and essentially cr creating our, our country certainly had these influences there. So again, I don't, I can't, I don't have, I haven't done the research or I don't know, uh, but there's certainly, again, at least within this phrase here, some linguistic connection between the Congressional Oath of Office and the Westminster Confession of Faith. Um, and again, it goes back to some of these, some of these words here. So uh, again, I, I, I think I agree with the Westminster Confession that Law, there is such thing as a lawful oath, uh, and we'll we'll touch on you know what Jesus's word at the end in Matthew. We'll we'll touch on that in a minute when we get there. But I just wanted to start off with that because I found that I like I said I saw that on on an episode and I thought I'd I'd share it with you all. Um, so we talked about Article Four. So Article Five, very simple one. Uh, we'll breeze through it real quick. Article Five says a vow is of the like nature with a promissory oath and ought to be made with the like religious care and to be performed with the like faithfulness. So essentially, what they're saying is there's a difference between an oath and a vow. Uh, an oath is is promising to do something, and a vow is promising to do something with a promis promissory note. So there's generally when we think of a vow. In this case, I think within the context of the Westminster Confession, they're actually thinking about a, a, a pledge, like a financial pledge. If you're promising to give something, uh, especially promising to give something to God, but probably if you're promising to give something in general, you, you take that same weight or, or it carries the same weight as that of, a, of an oath. Um, the passage, one passage here that, that's quoted is from Ecclesiastes, and I'll read those verses, Ecclesiastes 5, 4 through 6. Here, Kohelet says, when you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it. You know, that was his point. That's, if you make a vow to God, all right, well, what's the vow he's talking about? Don't be late in paying it. Okay, he's talking about a financial or, or some sort of fiduciary payment, whether it's, it is money or whether it's you're bringing a grain offering or, or whatever. If you're promising to give something to God, don't be late in paying it, he says. For he, God, takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Again, that was the, the, the concern is if you, if you make, and I'm going to use our language because, you know, Presbyterians, we like to make pledges. And, but when we, when we pledge to give something to, to God, 
the, the Bible very clearly says if, if you can't meet that pledge, it's better to not make that pledge than to pledge it and, and not pay. Uh, verse 6, do not let your speech cause you to sin and do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. You know, that's what Kohel, you know, the, the teacher's getting at here. You know, we, we can, and you know, we've, we've all experienced things like that. Oh, I made this pledge, but we didn't, we didn't foresee the, the, the financial expenses that were suddenly going to come this year. Uh, you know, whether I had a, you know, medical expenses or there was a car accident, things like that. Well, Kohelet tells us, don't tell God it was a mistake. Don't tell God you didn't miscalculate your, your finances. If you promise to give something to God, you better see it through. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? You know, why, why should God, you know, even uh, bat an eye that, that you didn't consider every option uh, before you? You didn't think to factor in uh, certain, you know, uh, life-changing events. Uh, the, we, we can't predict those things, but God, if you promise to God, that's how important these vows are to God, is that God expects us to see them through. Uh, and that's essentially what Article 5 is getting at. It's not, you know, there's the oath, which is swearing to, to do something. So, you know, swearing to bear witness. We talked about what those three types of oaths are. Uh, oaths of witness, oaths, oaths of allegiance, and oaths of covenant. So promising to, to bear witness to something, promising to, to be, uh, a lot, uh, be loyal to someone, uh, and promising just a, a, a covenant, bear, you know, making a, a covenant contract between two or more people. Uh, all those things are oaths, and then a vow is something similar. It just includes some sort of, it's a pledge, a financial uh, or fiduciary pledge, uh, and, it, and it carries the same weight as, as all the others. So that was a really short one. Any questions on, on that little article there? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but to, to one extent, too, I mean, it, what it does is it it's, comes down to the language of, of linguistics. Um, really, that's how words change over time. Um, I still think vow is appropriate. It's just when you're thinking about it, it really is legally, I guess, an oath. Uh, because you're promising to covenant yourself with your partner, um, not necessarily bringing something to them as, as an offering. Uh, but I think it just, it's just this, you know, the way language changes. Um, so uh, yeah, like I said, I would probably say, you know, if we were to update it, maybe we'd say vows and pledges instead of oaths and vows, because we don't really use oath unless it's, you know, like oath of office. Yeah. <laughs> So we would we would probably say or or promises and pledges maybe yeah yeah and actually there's some good alliteration there so you know if a preacher were to do this it'd be of promises and pledges uh, that's that's how I I would interpret that but that's a good good point good question all right Article six says it is not to be made to any creature but to God alone and that it may be accepted it is to be made voluntarily out of faith and conscience of duty in way of thankfulness for mercy received or for the obtaining of what we want, whereby we more strictly bind ourselves to necessary duties or to other things so far and so long as they may fit, fitly conduce thereunto. Whew, this is a, uh, this is a, a cumbersome uh, word. And again, I think it, it reflects more of that, that legal language that... Um, that they're bringing again to the, or th there's a reason why I, I think this chapter is a transition chapter between um, uh, the, the church. You know, we talked about what religious worship was in chapter 21, and then in chapter 23, we're going to talk about the civil magistrate. And, and I think this is a, a transition from the ecclesial to the secular. Uh, and there seems to be a connection, at least perhaps in the minds of the Westminster divines, that lawful oaths and vows are what can connect the, the church and the state or, or, or things that are perhaps shared by the church and the state. That might be another way of, of saying it. And so that's why I think there's a lot more legal language going on in here rather than ecclesial language because I think in the mind of the Westminster divines, and of course in the world in 1643, it 
England is a theocracy. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it has a, a parliament and it has a, a government, but the, the king is head of the church. Uh, so there's still a, a, a theocracy in mind when, when these folks are drafting this document. So while we would divorce the, the politics from the church, they, they might be trying to separate the two spheres, which we'll talk about in the next one, but that's, that is a, a Calvinistic understanding that the church has a sphere and the state has a sphere. But Calvin and, and I would say the Westminster Divines understand that this sphere, while they're distinct, they, they sometimes overlap. And where they're overlapping in the Westminster Confession is here when it comes to lawful oaths and vows. And again, next chapter, they'll, they'll give in a little bit more detail on what are the duties of the, the civil magistrate in light of, of the, the church and light of Christian faith. Um, so this article, again, like I said, it's talking a lot about uh, legalistic or legal language here. Um, in order that this the, the vow or the oath to be accepted is to be made voluntarily out of faith. So there's two things there. Voluntarily, there has to, it has to be voluntary and it has to be out of faith. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 23, Moses says, You shall be careful to perform what goes out of your lips, just as you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised. So there's this notion that we, we, we can't be com- coerced or, or uh, when we go and, and bring an oath or a vow before God, it's not out of compulsion. It's voluntarily. We, we bring it to God or we say it before God and, and, the, and the nation or whoever uh, because we are voluntarily stepping up to perform that duty or fill that office or make this promise, whatever, whatever it is, uh, to give this pledge because we recognize that, uh, as you know, the Westminster Confession says, in a way of thankfulness for mercy received or in obtaining what we want. So we recognize God's providence uh, and God's sovereignty. And so we voluntarily step up to, to make this pledge or this, this promise. Um, and it's in faith. Psalm 50 verse 14, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. So here the psalmist pretty much brings together the, the ecclesial with, you know, again, in, the, in Israel, it was a theocracy, so it's, there's no separation of church and state there. Uh, and so again, here the psalmist says, when you offer your God, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving, you are also faithfully paying your vows to the Most High God. Uh, again, in light of, of our promises to God, so you know we're talking about a vow, and a vow is a, a financial or fiduciary uh, commitment, a promissory commitment to God. Well, we give to God, we, we pledge, I'll just, again, I'll use our language because that's what we're familiar with. We bring our pledges, our offering, our tithes, whatever we want to call them, to God voluntarily and out of faith, not composed, not, not coerced. Um, you know, this is one of the reasons why, and, and I, I haven't quite settled where I, I feel or think on this, but one of the reasons why I'm hesitant to encourage uh, online giving is because it could, the potential is there for the, the tithe or the offering that you're pledging to become like another bill. Because we, a lot of people, especially today, I, I do, we, we pay several, some of our bills online. Uh, and, and that's what's nice is there's, there's convenient. I don't have to write a check. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to schedule. Oh, if I miss this check, what am I going to do? Is it going to bounce? You know, there, there, there is a little bit of, of uh, hassle-freeness to it. I'm not sure that's a word, uh, but you know, there, there, there is this sense of, of, of uh, liberty, I guess, if you will, l- that I don't have to worry so much about these bills being paid on time because I know that the bank draft is going to go through or it's going to go through on my credit card, stuff like that. But at the, on the flip side of that, when I think about my bills and I pay them online, I, they're, they're voluntary to one degree, but in another sense, I'm coerced because if I don't pay that internet bill or I don't pay that power bill, my power's going to get cut off or I'm going to, my internet's going to get, get cut off or the water's going to get cut off. And so there's a, a, a sense of coercion there uh, that, that isn't so much voluntary like a promissory gift is or, or a pledge to God is. And so again, I, I'm, not, I'm not condemning people for doing online giving because I, I, 
I recognize it's still giving. I just internally, when I'm wrestling with the theology of online giving or the philosophy of online giving, the, the potential for someone to view it no longer as a voluntary gift, but as a, as a, I'll say as a coercive bill could be there. Now, ideally, you know, that per, the, the church that has online giving has a sound biblical preacher who is also showing and, and expositing that, you know, it's not, it's not a bill. Uh, it is a voluntary giving, even if it's coming out of your, you know, bank draft monthly automatically. Um, so again, that there, all, some of those parts have to be necessary. Again, I, I'm not opposed to online giving. I just, I'm theologically hesitant because of ver- f- phrases like this, where, you know, the, the vow, the pledge, that it may be accepted to be made voluntarily and out of faith. Uh, now, of course, the Westminster Divines didn't have our technology. They didn't have credit cards. They didn't have online giving or bank drafts or anything like that. So perhaps, you know, if they were writing this same document today, they, they might say something completely different. They might, they might, you know, word it a little bit differently, which they probably would. But that's just, that was just sort of my, my take on it. Um, the, another sentence in here that I wanted to point out or, or lift up is it says, we more strictly bind ourselves to necessary duties. I thought that was an interesting phrase. And when I thought about it, trying to understand it in, in my own context, when we think about what, what I think when this verse is saying this is whenever we go to say, um, if you're going to go to uh, if you're going to go on vacation or something, or, or you, you want to, um, I just had an example and now I lost it. Uh, but if, 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 you're gonna, if you're gonna do something or, or perhaps get something, generally the, whoever it is or the contractor might want a, a down payment of some sort or, or, you know, some, uh, or if, if you're gonna sign up to do, say, say you're gonna do, I'll just use an example, a mission trip or something. You're gonna go on a mission trip. And, um, and if you, you're more likely to commit to going on that mission trip a year out if you put down some money, right? Or, or yeah, or, or like, you know, the, the deposit, I was thinking the youth group, you know, I just thought that's a good, I just came in my head there. You know, we, we get our youth to go to Montreat and to promise that, to, to preserve their seat, to make sure that they're actually gonna go through with it, we ask for a, a deposit of a certain amount of money, uh, like a hundred bucks or something like that. Something that's, you know, it's not, you know, hundred bucks is a drop in the bucket for some people, but it's still enough to say, all right, I've committed to doing this thing. That's how I understood when we think, when we need to think about vows biblically. And again, we're talking about pledges are, are what we're giving to God. Uh, we, we are more strictly binding ourselves to our necessary duties. We are, it's not just we're promising to do something, which that alone should, you know, the weight of that should be convincing. But now we've promised financially to pledge to this thing. And, and now this, this, in my mind, co- means I'm more committed to it. I'm more committed to seeing it through because I've, I've now committed money toward it uh, or something of my, of my finances. And a couple examples here, uh, Genesis 28 verses 20 through 22. Uh, Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear, and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone, which I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a 10th to you. So here, Jacob is just making a promise uh, to God, this promise of, of deliverance. If God will, will deliver me, will see me through, will, will protect me on this journey. Uh, and of course, he's also thinking about his brother Esau, who wants, who he thinks wants his head, which is, you know, we'll have that conversation later. But, um, you know, so he's, he's praying and and as a vow, as a promise, he set he promises to one set up a pillar which will be God's house, which actually becomes the the place where where the temple is eventually built. But more than that, he says, and and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. So there, Jacob is is vowing, he's pledging to God in light of, of binding himself to God's mercy and to God's grace by promising one-tenth of, of his, of whatever, of what, what God has given to him, he'll return back to God. And in 1 Samuel verse 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 11, Hannah does something very similar when she's praying to God. She made a vow and said to God, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, 
but will give your maid servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come to his head. So in this case, of course, she's talking about Samuel there, her son Samuel. It's not a, a financial promise. It's not a, 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 a fiduciary uh, a promissory note. In this case, it's the son that she wants. This She's a barren and she wants a son. And if God is, is, is going to bless her, if God's providence is going to pour upon her and, and give her a son, she promises to dedicate that son, her son, to, to God. So it's not just money. It can be other things, other promises, but that's this, that's this notion, this vow that we are binding ourselves to, to necessary duties in that sense. So, any questions? Yeah. <laughs> you know it is. <laughs> so, those two instances, the, the, you know, Jacob and, and um, Hannah, Hannah. Mm -hmm. isn't that kind of the same thing as like when we pray, oh God, if you'll just whatever, then I promise I will whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's to me, of, that was bargaining. Making God do something you want mm -hmm. by saying, well, if you do this, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. so, and we're not supposed to do that. Well, we, we <laughs> so here's the thing. We're not supposed to do it flippantly. If we pray faithfully, remember Jesus says, if whatever you pray in faith, if truly pray it faithfully, God will see it through. Now, if we're trying to bargain with God to convince him that, hey, I'm going to do all this for you. If you just do this little thing for me, that is not praying in faith. And of course, that prayer will never come to fruition. Hannah and Jacob and many others, they're praying in true faith, in a deep sense of faith. They recognize that God is the one who opens the barren womb. God is the one who provides uh, and brings peace between rival uh, siblings. It's God is the one who, who cares. And, and in his providence, so we might say, if we were to say a similar prayer, we might say, Lord, in your providence, please provide such and such daily bread for me. Uh, and, and, and in light of that provision, in light of your mercy, in light of your gift of grace, which I do not rightly deserve, but you freely give, I promise to blah, blah, blah. You know, and we have to remember, if we say that in our prayers, that is a lawful oath. And if we aren't prepared to see that promise through, well, one, we shouldn't be praying it. And two, we, are, we should expect a curse if we don't. And so it's not flippantly saying, oh God, I, you know, I just wish you would do all this. And if you did all that for me, I promise I'll do that, you know, do whatever. I'll go to church more often. I'll do it. You should be going to church more often anyways. <laughs> you, you, don't need, you don't need to promise to God more of your time. Uh, but in this case, it's, it's a lawful oath. It, to, to bind yourself to God, uh, as, as to God's providence and God's promise. So again, it's, it's not just the words that we say, it really is also the heart, the disposition. If we, if we are trying to bargain with God or if we're trying to be flippant with God, absolutely that's wrong. And by saying it in prayer, you're actually committing an unlawful oath and therefore a sin before God and the Westminster Divines. But again, there's nothing erroneous or nothing sinful with what Jacob and Hannah and many others have done and what perhaps many of us have done uh, when we think about when we are really truly committing ourselves to God. So I, th I think we, we, we have to be careful when we approach that and just use these examples of saying, oh God, you know, give, me, give me such and such thing and I'm gonna, I'll pray more often. Yeah. You should be praying more often. You should be going to church more often. You should be giving more of your time already. If you're going to promise something to God, actually promise something that is a sacrifice uh, to give to God. Uh, again, you know, think about the example here. A tenth of what Jacob would get from God. Jacob was already a wealthy man. Uh, he, he has two wives. He's got a bunch of kids. He's got uh, lots of flock. A tenth of that is a lot to give to God. Hannah is barren. She has no children. She, she, she's nothing. And now she's promising if God gives her what she wants, a son, she's not going to keep him for him herself. She's going to give him to God. And he's going to be God. He's going to live. I mean, that's a huge sacrifice. Um, you know, as someone who now has two children of my own, I mean, that's, would I be able to make that promise to God? That's a tough, that, that's, that's not something flippant. For Hannah to say, if you give me a kid, I'm going to give him to you. 
No, that's, that's a very heavy, weighty vow to give to God, to make to God. Um, that, that's just how I would answer, how, yeah, respond to that. Any other questions on that? All right, last article then. Give you a little sip of coffee. No man may vow to do anything forbidden in the word of God or what would hinder any duty therein commanded or which is not in his own power and for the performance whereof he hath no promise of ability from God. In which respects, popish monastical vows of perpetual single life, professed poverty, and regular obedience are so far from being degrees of higher perfection that they are superstitious and sinful snares in which no Christian may entangle himself. So there's two sentences here, and you could probably tell very clearly which one is the Westminster Divine's most potent because it has uh, a lot of alliteration. But before we deal with the second sentence, uh, I want to unpack the first one a little bit. Um, you know, they say no man may vow to do anything forbidden uh, in the word of God. So again, we're, we're, we're still talking about vows and oaths. Again, they're very similar. The, the only difference is that a vow has some sort of promissory note to it that you, you promise to give God or you promise to bind yourself uh, to, to such duty. And again, the Westminster Divines say very clearly that we cannot vow to do anything that is forbidden in the word of God. And if, it's, if it is expressly forbidden by God, we cannot promise to do that thing that is forbidden. Here's an example from Acts chapter 23. Um, and, and in this case, I'll explain it because it's not super clear. In verse 12, uh, when it was day, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. So there we see that the thing that God forbids is murder. Uh, and of course, not, not only is it just generally murder, murder is always bad, but now it's the murder of God's apostle whom he has called to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. So, you know, maybe you could, no, you should never try and, <laughs> and say murder is good depending on the person. No person is deserving of murder. And on top of that, the apostle Paul is not deserving of it. And so now these Jews have formed a conspiracy and bound themselves to an, with an oath saying that they would neither eat nor drink. That's the vow. Again, the promissory note that they would, they would essentially fast. They would never eat or drink anything until they had killed Paul. So that's the promise and the promissory note, the, the vow, the pledge is that they would fast in order, you know, until they do that. Um, verse 13, there were more than 40 of them who formed this plot. They came to the chief priests and the elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a solemn oath to taste nothing until we have killed Paul. Jump down to verse 21. The, there's a, a conversation going on and now uh, there's another voice comes in. He says, so do not listen to them. So he's talking to the, the, the people who've bound themselves to this oath. Do not listen to them for more than 40 of them are lying in wait for him who have bound themselves under a curse not to eat or drink until they slay him. And now they are ready and waiting for the promise from you. Um, so here they're, they're they're talking to people who are um, sympathetic to Paul, uh, to some of the other apostles. They know that there's a group of people know that there's a plot out there trying to, to kill Paul. And this is, this is their warning. And they recognize, again, the, the point that I want to, is in that verse 21, is that they have bound, these 40 men have bound themselves under a curse. Uh, so it's not, so we recognize that if you, promise if you swear an oath I mean, everything was legal about it you know they 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 had an objective which is kill paul and they had the promissory note which is to you know abstain from eating and drinking you know those parts were legal but of course the illegal part is the murder is the is the killing of the apostle paul and that that they've promised to do that the bible very clearly teaches us it is a curse so no longer is it a lawful oath, but it's actually they've, they've bound themselves with a curse or to a curse and they will be accursed. Uh, so there's this notion that we cannot, 
bind ourselves to anything that is forbidden in the word of God. Now, of course, we can do it physically. We have the ability to do it, but we shouldn't do it. We can't do it. Otherwise, it will be a curse. Um, not only that, not only we can't, you know, shouldn't uh, vow to do anything forbidden in the word of God, nor any man should vow to do anything which is not in his own power. So again, we talked a little bit about that already under the oaths, but now you, you can't promise by giving something or promising to do something if you don't even have the power to do it. Numbers 30 verses 9 through 12. But the vow of a widow or a divorced woman, everything by which she has bound herself shall stand against herself. However, if she vowed in her husband's house and bound herself by an obligation with an oath and her husband heard it and but said nothing to her and did not forbid her, then all her vows shall stand and every obligation by which she bound herself shall stand. But if her husband indeed annuls them on the day he hears them, then whatever proceeds out of her lips concerning her vows or concerning the obligation of herself shall not stand. Her husband has annulled them and the Lord will forgive her. So again, this, this, is a, this is a complicated passage in Numbers 30, talking about the relation between husbands and wives uh, and, and the, the duties that are, that are there. The, the point that I wanted to highlight is that verse 12, you know, if, if the husband annuls her, her you know, in, in this case, the husband has the power to annul the wife's promise. So, you know, say she, you know, she goes and promises uh, 12 head of calf cattle to, you know, a neighbor for something. And the husband hears that. He says, no, no, we, we, we can't do that. Uh, we don't have 12 cattle or we, there's no way that we could actually see that promise through. He can annul that promise that she made. And again, this point here, you know, her husband has annulled them and the Lord will forgive her. The Lord will forgive her. So clearly she's done something wrong. <laughs> In the, in, the light of, in the light of the Bible. And so uh, that God is willing to forgive her because the husband has annulled it. But if the husband hasn't heard it, go back, let's, we're moving backwards, back to verse uh, 10. However, if she vowed in her husband's house uh, with, and her husband heard it but said nothing to her, so if the husband hears her vow, oh, I, you know, I'm going to give you 12 head of cattle. The husband knows he doesn't have 12 head of cattle to give <laughs> anyway. He doesn't know when he's going to have 12 head of cattle. And she promises, yeah, but he doesn't say anything then, or does it forbid her, then all her vows shall stand and every obligation by which she bound herself shall stand. So she will have to pay that 12 head of cattle for whatever promise she made, however she could find it. And if the husband didn't stop her, then she's going to have to do it or she's made a false promise before God and will be accursed for it. So... <laughs> <laughs> well, again, it's. Uh, uh, it, <laughs> well, and I think it, it gets to the point of if you can't actually see it through, don't make that promise. And, and that's and that's the point. And again, you know, in the system, that's the responsibility of the husband to, make, to pay attention to. You know, because the, the the wife isn't this slave who's doing nothing. She's the homekeeper. She's in charge of. You know, we who it was Martha who commented. She read uh, Proverbs. 31 or whatever she said she had a laugh but i mean you listen to what what a wise wife does what a good wife does if you go and listen to it she's out there buying property she's out there raising the home she's out there you know doing all these financial she has a big responsibility in the household the the husband is just a breadwinner he's he's literally just the meat bringer he's he doesn't do anything it's the wife who does all she's the brains he's the brawn and if and if she does something that you know shouldn't be done or she commits to something that she can't actually see through and the husband doesn't step in and say, hey, honey, we, we can't actually afford that. That's not something we can, we can do. If he fails to do that, now she has bound herself to seeing that through. And if she doesn't see it through, then she's cursed by God. And if she does see it through, then, you know, hopefully that's some good stewardship and good financial uh, stuff going on there. But, you know, again, it's this notion that as, as partners in this marriage, uh, again, we're just talking about marriage here, but you can expand it to any relationship, any contractual relationship. If, if we promise to do something that we can't actually do, then we are potentially bringing a curse. As the Ecclesiastes said, it's better not to make that pledge than to pledge and, and fall short or, or see it through. 
Um, and, and, you know, here's a, a flip side example. In Judges chapter 11, verses 9 through 11, uh, Jephthah says to the elders of Gilead, if you take me back to fight against the sons of Ammon and the, Lord's, the Lord gives them up to me, will I become your head? So essentially here, Jephthah, he's one of the judges and he's asking these elders in Gilead, all right, if you take me over there and I'm, uh, you take me to the fight, you, you bring me to the front lines before these Ammonites and, and, and if God hands them over to me and I'm, I'm victorious over them and I, and I beat them in battle, will you, elders of Gilead, will you put me as your leader? Will you lift me up as your, as your governor, whoever, you know, let me, will I be in charge of you? On the elders of Gilead, said to Jephthah, the Lord is witness between us. Surely we will do as you have said. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made war, excuse me, and the people made him head and chief over them. And Jephthah spoke all these words before the Lord of Mithra. And you keep on reading through Judges, you come to find out that what the Gileadites did was wrong. Uh, and, and that now what happens is, you know, go through it a little bit later on Judges 11, the, because of what they have done, the, the Giladites are now, they've now essentially perpetually committed themselves to be slaves of Israel because what they did was wrong. They, they actually didn't have the power to appoint Jephthah as their elder. Only God has that power to a point. And he did call Jephthah to be their elder and their leader. Um, and, but because they made this vow that they didn't have the ability to do, they became a perpetual slaves to Israel. Now, Jephthah isn't, isn't, he wasn't clear. If you know anything about Jephthah, Jephthah in, in his craziness, he also makes a promise to God. And this is his promise. He says to God, if, if you deliver the Ammonites to my hand, so this is a promise. I will give to you whatever walks through my front door. I don't know what he was thinking. Who, who was he expecting some, some donkey to walk through his front door? Uh, you know, I don't know. So God hands the Ammonites over to, you know, he, he's victorious over the Ammonites. And guess who walks through his front door? His daughter. And he has to, and he has to sacrifice her, give her to God because that was his promise. And you see, so, and, you know, so, so you know that he's not, he wasn't, uh, he didn't get off easy by trying to convince the Giladites to be their, their leader. So again, this notion that we, we cannot vow to do something that is not within our power. An example of both the Giladites, you know, the, they, the, if God handed the Ammonites over to Jephthah, the, the vow would be the Giladites would become Essentially, he would be their leader over them, and then he would hand his daughter over as a sa or whatever came through his door as a sacrifice to God. Exactly, it really is, and that's an example of of an unfaithful thing. Because what 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 Jephthah, Jephthah's sin is that he actually doesn't have enough faith in God. He says, God, if, essentially, he's saying, God, if if you hand over the Ammonites. Uh, in you know to uh, to me, then I will do something for you. Rather, he should just had faith that God was going to hand over the Ammonites, that 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 God was going to make him victorious because God had called him and appointed him as a, as one of the judges, and he's seen all the other previous. Well, he'd heard about the other judges and how God delivered Israel's enemies into their hands. All he had to do was just have faith, but he didn't. So he tried to bargain with God, and of course. That fell through for both the Giladites and for and for his own family. So yeah. And this is this is the this is the weight of an oath, a vow before God. All right, so that's that first sentence there. Now the second sentence is I I think this sentence is the thrust of this whole chapter. The whole reason why the Westminster Divines included this chapter, and there's a whole bunch of other things, but is to lead up to this sentence. And I'll read it one more time. In which respects, popish monastical vows of perpetual single life, professed poverty, and regular obedience are so far from being degrees of higher perfection that they are, I'm going to add a word, they are actually superstitious and sinful snares in which no Christian may entangle himself. And so that's, that was the, the concern of the Westminster Divines. And of course, this is the concern of the Reformation. 
Um, you know, Calvin hated the monastic system. Luther, who was a monk, he came to realize how sinful the monastic system really was because the monastic system essentially created two levels of Christians. You know, there's the layman, the layperson, you know, the farmer, the barmaid, the, you know, everybody who's a normal, the, the peasant in the world who comes to church and does what they do and say their Hail Marys and, you know, fuddles through the, the Latin, whatever they're doing, you know, that's, that's one level of Christian. But above them are the monks and the nuns. These are the, the Christians who, who recognize and, and they devote themselves fully to God and they, they promise these vows of poverty and these vows of, of celibacy and these, these vows of perfection to God and, and now they're higher ones. And, and that's why most uh, saints in the Catholic Church come from monasteries and nunneries. Very few, I mean, there are some, but very few saints of the church are actually common peasants. No, they're, they're friars, they're, they're abbots, they're monks and nuns. They're people who've dedicated their entire lives to, 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 to the church. And now they are better Christians. And we can rely on them, the church says, to, to intercede on our behalf to, to God. Of course, the, the Westminster divines and the reformers saw this as something that's unbiblical. There, there's, there's, and, and as they say, you know, it's superstitious and it's a sinful snare. Uh, we, we can't draw that distinction between more faithful and less faithful Christians. It's the exact same argument as you know, the, uh, the Ephesians had as they were fighting between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. Well, the, the, the Jewish Christians felt they were better because they, they had the history that Jesus had. They know about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They share that common lineage with Jesus. In fact, they're, they're blood Jews like Jesus. Those Gentiles, though, those are lesser Christians. They don't, know, they don't know all the history. They don't know the Hebrew. Uh, they need to learn that. They need to become Jewish in order to become truly Christian. And so within the church in the first century, there's already divisions between types of Christians, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. And Paul, of course, says, no, that's not to be the case. We need to have a unity in Christ, which all, you know, Ephesians talks about that. And so again, the Westminster divines highlight a few things here. There's the perpetual single life, which is, you know, the vow, the vow of celibacy, uh, professed poverty, which is the vow, vow of poverty, uh, and the vow of monasticism. And they point out to three passages where these are, are addressed uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 2, and then verses 8 through 9, um, Paul says to the church, But because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. Now, we'll unpack, I'm hoping to going to do a study on 1 Corinthians next summer, so we'll really unpack chapter 7. But Paul's concern is, is there is sexual immorality running rampant in the church in Corinth. And one of the ways that Paul sees these sexual immoralities to be uh, uh, subsided or, or to be controlled is for uh, men and women to get married, for, for husbands to, to have a wife, uh, to have their own wife. Uh, but he also recognizes that in verse 8, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows that it is good for them to them if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn without passion. And so, or excuse me, to burn with passion. And so again, Paul's talking about these passionate lusts that, that people have in their, in their hearts towards, towards others. And again, Paul is saying it's better that those passions are rightly focused in the covenant of marriage than for sexual immorality to be running rampant. The same, the Westminster Divines take this and, and, and flip the same way too. A, a, a person doesn't need to commit himself to celibacy, to, to the single life, to singleness, uh, because, you know, just because Jesus lived that way uh, and Paul lived that way, that's, that's, not, the, that's not a good example. Uh, because the other 12 apostles, as far as we, well, not all of them, but at least most of them, we, the ones that we know that are named, had families. Uh, had, had, most of them had wives. You know, Peter has a wife. Uh, he talks about his being in his Jesus' uh, headquarters was in his was in Peter's mother's in law mother in law's house. Uh, too many S's there, and so you know there's this notion that even Peter, you know, the Bishop of Rome, the first Pope, 
had a wife. Now, I don't know what the, I, I haven't talked about to a Catholic, I don't know how they, they reconcile that, but, uh, you know, so there's this recognition that uh, this, Paul even says, while he would encourage people to remain single, and again, we have to think about Paul's context too, he doesn't know when Jesus is returning. Uh, he, he, he might believe that the return is, is soon, maybe, maybe within his life, maybe not, he doesn't know. But he would rather people, you know, not to commit to frivolous covenants. Uh, he'd rather them be single like he is. But if they're burning with passions, with lust, with, with these desires, then they need to get married in order for those passions to be rightly focused through the covenant of marriage. Um, in, for the vow of poverty, they point to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. He who steals must steal no longer but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. And so there's this notion that some, some monks and some nuns were, were promised to be poor, you know, to not, to not to whole, own anything, to, to live off of the, the generosity of others, of the, of the church, of, the, of whoever. The, the Westminster Vines pointed to say, no, that's, that's not the way it's supposed to be. We are to be industrious. Paul says something similar in 1 Thessalonians to, that you know, we're not to uh, try and, and live off of the other. We're not to live off of the church. We help the church. We support one another. Absolutely. He says that in Galatians, that we bear one another's burdens. But these are emergency situations, if you will, exceptions. That's not to be the rule. Poverty is not to be the rule. Now, of course, if you are poor and that's, you know, that's the, the station that God has given to you, then, then that's where you work in it. But you can't promise, you shouldn't vow to be poor, uh, to, to again, try to prove to God or, or convince God or do anything in, as, a, as a promise to God, God, if you, you know, deliver me from whatever, I, I will serve you in poverty. That's not a, a biblical vow. That's not a, a, a way of, of a really approaching uh, how we're supposed to, to, to love and serve God. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the vow of monasticism, uh, verses 21 and 24, were you, were, you, excuse me, were you called while a slave? That's his question Paul's asking. Well, don't worry about it. But if you are able also to become free, rather do that. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. So again, here he's talking about, so it's not... In Corinth, it wasn't just sexual morality. There seems to be some uh, strata differences. There's, there's clashes between the, the, the classes, the types of people. Uh, and here again, Paul's saying, if, if, were you, did you become a Christian as you were, when you were a slave? Well, don't worry about that. It, 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 you know, and he talk, we talked about that liberty, how Christian liberty gives us uh, a sense of freedom or, or a sense of freedom from our sin. Well, Paul says, if you became a Christian as a slave, don't worry about that. You know, you need to stay a slave. Now, if you had the opportunity of getting your freedom, go for it. Do that. Because Paul's, Paul's here is, you know, he who called us, for he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. So we have a freedom. And it's in Christ. If you have the opportunity to buy your freedom or earn your freedom from your slavery, then, then so be it. Then great, you should go for it. But if, if you're bound to be a slave forever, then stick with that estate. You're a Christian. You're, you're no longer a slave first. You're a Christian first. Remember that. Honor that. Live into that. And he goes on and talks about how you're supposed to serve your master. Likewise, he who is called while free. So here he's talking about the people who, who are not slaves, people who are freed. Guess what? You're Christ's slave. You now belong to Christ. You're not free to do your own thing. You're not free like a master in a secular setting might be free compared to his slave. No, you now are a slave to Christ. You were bought with a price. And because of that, both, you know, he's talking now both to slave people, enslaved and the free. Because you were bought with a price, do not become slaves of men. And this is where the, the Westminster Divines point to this notion that, that monasticism became this source of, of slavery, if you will. That, that the monks and the nuns are, are binding themselves 
to enslaving themselves essentially to the church. They're, they're, they're limiting what they're doing. They're, they're se segregating themselves into these convents and into these monasteries so that they can be separate from the rest of the dirty people in the world. I'm not sure many of them thought that way, but some, you know, that, again, that's the perspective of the Westminster divines. And so, brethren, each one of you is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. So the, the point that the Westminster divines say, and again, one of the concerns that, that is going around the medieval church is that if, if so say, say for instance, you, you're, you're a blacksmith, okay? Let's all imagine we're blacksmiths. And, uh, and we're, we're doing our blacksmithing thing, and then suddenly, you know, we, we love doing it, but, but we hear this message from, say, a, a, a traveling uh, pastor or someone, you know, a, a priest comes to the town, a new priest, the, the church appoints a new pastor in, in, the, in the church, and we go to church, and, and this, this pastor's priest is lifting up the, the monastic system. He's saying, you know, the, the, the best way that we can be Christians, the best way we live out our Christian life is when we promise to, to give ourselves to God fully, when we promise to, to live in lives that are, that are impoverished physically, but we are, we're rich with the Spirit. We, we promise to devote our entire lives 24-7 to the service of God. Here's the brochure for the next convent or a monastery. And then we as blacksmiths are like, oh, I'm not really serving God in my blacksmithery, am I? If I really want to serve God, maybe I need to become a monk. I, I want to go do that thing. Well, the Westminster Divines and the Reformers, and this was, this was Luther's I, main idea, is this notion of Christian vocation. He's like, you don't have to drop your, your, your secular world, your, your, you know, your job, your profession, in order to be a better Christian. Because monasticism, you're, you're enslaving yourself to the church. And so this notion of Christian vocation comes in. You know, Luther even goes so far as to say, even the executioner can, can glorify God in doing his role, his work as a, in execution. It's a little bit, it's a little bit strange. You know, and of course, in Luther's, in Luther's world, that's talking about the axe guy. And so, and so there's this, or, or the guy who pulls, no, I don't even think the gallows were invented back then. So, uh, you know, but there's this notion that, that the reformers uh, look to Paul and say, look, if you've been called, if you become a Christian and you're in this state, whatever that state is, whether you're a blacksmith or uh, you're, you're a farmer or you're a, a, a feudal slave or whatever you are, or a king or a prince, you know, you, you, that was, the, you know, the other, the other side, people think they, they you know, the, they can, you know, blacksmith can go live a, a problem. You know, some, some of these priests or princes gave up their, their, their wealth and their power, their influence in order to become monks, lowly monks. You know, the, the concern that the reformers had was, look, you could have done more good for the church if you had stayed a prince, a godly prince, and ruled as a godly leader than you're doing now as a monk in the middle of nowhere. And so, again, this notion that we, we live into our vocation, whatever that vocation is. And that was, again, one of the concerns that the Westminster divines saw and that the reformers saw is that the, the Catholic Church is pushing these things, this monasticism, these vows of monasticism, and yet they're unbiblical. They're, they're unlawful oaths and vows that the church is encouraging people uh, to, to submit to. So the... The concluding, I just want to conclude because we're over time now. So we need to reconcile this whole article, this whole chapter with Matthew chapter 5, verses 34 and 37. And just to repeat, I'll, I'll repeat what that says here. But I say to you, make no oath at all. Of course, this is Jesus. So I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your own head, for you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond this is of evil. So the, the question then is, 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 does Jesus nullify this whole chapter. I don't think so. Because when Jesus, what Jesus is talking about, I listened to his, his concern there. You know, when, when you make an oath, don't swear, I'm you know, adding words, but don't swear by heaven. Why? Well, because heaven is the throne of God. That's where God is. If you're going to swear, just swear in God's name. Don't swear by heaven because that's where God is. How about you just swear in God's name? Or by the earth. You can't swear by the earth because guess what? 
The earth is the footstool of God. You know, the earth is beneath God. The earth is under God. Why are, why are you going to swear by something that's beneath God? Or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. You know, it, if, we, if you're going to swear by something maybe connected to God that's on earth, you might think, oh, well, I'll swear by Jerusalem. Why, why? Jesus, don't, you don't need to swear by Jerusalem. That just represents the throne of God. Just swear by God. No, you shall make an, nor shall you make an oath by your own head. We talked about this. We, you know, the, 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 the reality of an oath or a covenant or a contract, why we have them is because sometimes we can't promise to do things on our, on, our, on, our, on our honor, so to speak. We might say that, but we need a witness to, to say, okay, yes, this is a trustworthy person. I use the example of, uh, you know, when you're doing a job search, you ask for references for someone. Um, or if you're, you know, you're going to give something to someone, you, you, or you know, you're going to hire a contractor to do work on your on your house. Um, you you probably want to get references, uh, people, you know, where they've worked, and you want to hear: Is this person honorable? Is this person uh, actually going to follow through? Is this, per-? you know, we we have to we do that. You you still might you might not do a paper contract. You might still do by the shake of the hand, but you're probably going to want to get some references. And that's the point here that Jesus is saying: We can't we can't swear on our own, on our own head, because we, we don't have the power to make our hair white or black. And so he says, let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. When we say yes or no, we're doing so as believers. Okay, he's, he's talking to believers, people who are faithful followers. When you say yes, when you say no, when you commit to do something, you're doing so under the auspices and under the vision of God. And by extension, we are swearing before God without having to say, you know, I swear in God's name or doing, we don't, we don't have to say that. Simply by being a Christian and promising to do something, saying yes, saying no, then we are doing it by God's name, in God's name. Because guess what? We're, we're purchased by God's name. We have been redeemed by God. Uh, and so this, the, the concern is not so much that you know, we, we swear, or Jesus' concern isn't so much swearing at all. It's making sure we don't swear flippantly. That we recognize, you know, if you're going to say yes, if you're going to say no, if you're going to commit to do something, make sure you're faithful and recognizing that you are promising to do it before God. Because Jesus doesn't nullify contracts. He says, let your yes be yes, your no be no. Agree to do things or agree not to do things. That's still a contract. That's still an oath. That's still a covenant. What Jesus is doing is echoing what is true in all of Scripture. When we promise to do something, be faithful to it. Make sure you can see that you can follow through on what you're promising. And know that if you fall short of that promise, God actually cares about what you say. And if you can't carry that burden of your promise, it's better if you don't promise at all. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And again, I think the Westminster Divine's main concern is this last article, the last sentence, that monastic vows are, are unbiblical. They're essentially works of righteousness that the church should not be binding Christians to do. Any questions on all that? When did they start requiring uh, celibacy of the priests? The Hebrews, their priests were married. Mm-hmm. Peter was married. And for some part of history mm-hmm. there, the priests were married. And all of a sudden, it's a requirement. When did that hit? Yeah, I don't know. You know, I, I'd have to, I haven't done that research. I don't know. A Catholic would certainly know more. A quick Google search might, might reveal that answer. But um, certainly, I, mean, I can think of... I can think of examples of some of the early saints, so like Justin Martyr, Moses the Black, maybe Ignatius of Black. I think all those folks were celibate, so, or, or at least they weren't married. And so, you know, it seems that by the second and third, or by the third and fourth centuries, there seems to be this notion that single life is the holy life. Um, but I don't know where that came about or why it came about. So I can't answer that part. But it's, it is pretty early in, in church history, uh, within two or three centuries of, of the church. Any other questions? All right. 
But let me close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I, I'm so thankful for your word and, and the promise and the convictions that we need to be cognizant of, of what we say and what we promise to do or promise not to do. Uh, Lord, I, I hope and I pray that as we go about living the, the rest of our days, that we, we pay attention and let our yes be yes and our no be no, because when we say that we're going to do something, we're saying it in your presence. And when we solemnly swear to do something in a ceremony or whatever uh, uh, auspices of an office we might be in, Lord, may we truly and faithfully live that out. Whether it's the office of elder or if anyone runs for president, Lord, I pray that you, you help us to, to live into the promises that you have given to us and the promises that we make with you. Remind us that we need to be aware of, of our abilities and what we are capable of doing and our own limitations. Lord, may we be approach whatever we say and do with humility and reverence before your throne. Because Lord, we know that you do take seriously our words. You care about what we say. And so God, I pray that you guide us in your Holy Spirit, nurture us in wisdom and discernment. Lord, we pray all this in the name of Christ, our Savior.